How's it going, LC students? Make some noise tonight. Let's go. Well, thank you all for being here on this sunny Sunday night. I know the weather out there is gorgeous, but you guys decided to hang in here, get some Jesus tonight. So thank you guys so much. My name is Josiah, part of the team here. And we're going to continue our series called Disciples, and I'm super excited. Give it up for Pastor Nate. He did a great job preaching the message last week, kicked off the series. Come on. It's going to be a great series. Super excited. Um, but today we're going to start off in a little, a, um, a more unique way. Um, kind of Nate mentioned it, a lot of stuff has been going on in our country, and the Bible says, mourn with those who mourn, and, or weep with those who weep, and rejoice with those who rejoice, right? And so I want to take a moment of silence and, and pray over, over the cities, Minneapolis, Indianapolis, Chicago, pray over the victims and the families, Dante Wright, Adam Toledo, George Floyd, pray over them, and just sit like Jesus sat with Mary and Martha, who just lost Lazarus, to mourn with those who mourn, to sit in this moment, because I think it's so easy to move and jump right into this series, right into this message, and forget to actually be Jesus, to actually be the church in these moments, and to pray that God would continue to heal, to pray for justice, to pray for freedom. So you guys take a moment of silence with me. Jesus, we pray that you would heal our land. God, we pray for seas of justice. God, we pray for your unconditional love and unconditional grace over our lives, over those communities over the families that lost a loved one this past week, this past month, this past year. God, we pray that you continue to do a work in our hearts, a work in the hearts of our enemies. God, do you continue to heal black and brown communities. I would pray for racial reconciliation all over Pierce County all over Washington, all over the United States, all over this world. Jesus, we need you. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we are continuing our series called Disciples, and Nate preached a powerful message talking about, or titled, God Chose You. And I think it's so crazy that God chose us broken, messed up sinners to communicate a perfect God, to communicate a perfect gospel. Like, it's just crazy. Like, I, I just, like, I just, like, look at my life and, and growing up, and I see your guys' lives, and I'm like, God chose us? <laughs> like, you could have had another person, another plan, but you chose us? Like, are you serious? And God's looking at us like, hey, you're the best. <laughs> You're the best. Right, okay, God, you're the best. You're the best too. Thank you. Like, he, he chose us. It's so crazy. He chose us to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He chose us. But what, what I want us to focus on tonight is that before you ever disciple people, you are being discipled by Jesus. Before you ever want to be a discipler, that you continue to look around for people who can disciple you. And that we'd always choose to be discipled by Jesus before we choose to be a discipler. Because it's so easy to get caught up in the platform, in the leadership, in the voice, and forget that we were created to follow Jesus first before we are leaders for Jesus. I want to talk about actually what it means to be a disciple of Jesus tonight. It's called disciples, right? So what does it actually mean to be a disciple? And so we're going to be reading out of 1 Timothy 4, 
If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If you don't have your Bibles, you can look on the screen. Or you can your, use your app on your phone. Timothy just received a letter from his homie Paul. Timothy is the first next generation leader. Right? What, what does that mean? It means when, when Jesus came, everyone who like, followed him and they gave their life to him, they grew up and they started growing the church. And then the next generation of people who started leading, the, Timothy was the first one. Right? So he's a, he's a young pastor at a church, and, and his homie Paul, his discipler, sends him a letter, a personal letter, and saying, hey, Timothy, I know you're young. I, I know you're trying to lead this church in the, in the right direction, so I'm going to write you a letter to help you do that. Right? And he writes this in, in 1 Timothy 4. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. Okay, Paul. They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods, but God created those foods to be eaten. Everyone say, praise Jesus. God created those foods to be eaten mm, with thanks by faithful people who, knew, who, who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, someone say amen. amen. Since everything, thank you, Josiah, I can hear you back there. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know it is made acceptable by the word of God in prayer. If you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus. One who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching you have followed. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Will you guys pray with me? Jesus, thank you so much for every single person in this room, every single person watching online via Twitch right now. God, we pray that you'd speak to our hearts, you'd speak to our minds, we'd leave encouraged, knowing the true hope we have in you. We love you so much, in Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. So when I, was, when I was doing the internship here at Life Center, hashtag LCI, hashtag shout out to all my interns, when I was doing the internship, my second year, I was doing the pastoral track, like our friend Nathan's doing, right? And I had this opportunity, right? We were getting a guest speaker in town, and the pastor comes up to me and is like, okay, Josiah, I have an assignment for you. I was like, ooh, okay. You know, I'm, try I'm like trying to be a pastor. I'm like, I'm like I want to do like everything that's given to me. He's like, okay, I want you to pick up the guest speaker that's speaking this entire weekend. I want you to pick him up at the airport. I was like, ooh, the airport? I get to go to the airport? He's like, yeah, I'm pick him up. I was like, okay, I will. It's like, which car, which car should I drive? Like, whenever, whenever someone asks the question, which car should you drive, that's like them insinuating they don't want to drive their own car, right? Or like, they don't have any gas, or they don't want to pay for gas, or their car's ugly. So they're like, what, what kind of car should we take? Whose car should we take? Right? Because I, I wanted to take the pastor's car. And you know, it's all blacked out Lincolns, it's super nice. I was like, okay, which car should we take? And he was like, oh, just take your car. I was like, God, dang it. Just take my Toyota Corolla 2007. Let's go. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, t I'll take my car. He's like, when do you pick them up? He's like, pick them up on Friday, bring them here. He's going to preach Saturday night, all, all day Sunday. It's going to be amazing. I was like, okay, cool. So the first thing I did, I was like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. So I took my car to the car wash. Ooh, it's nice on the outside. And then I took it home, started vacuuming the inside, you know, and just getting so, like, detailed with every little thing. You've been some gum off the floor, going in and out of the cre all the crevices. It's kind of gross. It's even gross words. Like, all the crevices of the car. And, like, this is how you know you're, like, really trying to clean your car. I don't know, middle schoolers you don't understand, or maybe you're cleaning your parents' car. But you get the Windex and the, the inside of the windows with Windex, and you, and you just rub it down, super clean. Like, I'm, I detail this car. Like, I could be a detailer of cars. Like, I don't even know what that is. But I'm like, I could detail cars. And I was like, I am ready to pick this guy up. I'm super excited. I drive up to SeaTac. I'm like, woo, I'm feeling good. Got the shades on and everything. I'm looking good, too, you know? Got the white button up, acting like I'm a chauffeur. I'm picking this guy up in a 2007 Toyota Corolla, feeling so good. I like wait outside the car, hold the sign. No, I didn't have a sign. But I'm like waiting for him. I'm like, I, have, I get there. I'm like, I have no idea what this guy looks like. 
His name was Jackson, and I'm like, I have no idea what Jackson looks like. And so like, I'm searching on Facebook. You ever do that? You're like trying to find someone, and you just search on Facebook, Instagram. He didn't have an Instagram. He's a little older. But like, I was searching on Facebook. I found him. I was like, okay, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? I found him. I was like, hey, hey, pastor. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, can I take your bag? And he just hands me his bag. He puts his bag in the trunk, closed the door for him, everything. Just like, okay. <laughs> Had water. Uh, Hey, that's a good touch. Hey, if you're, ever, if you're ever like an Uber driver or you're picking someone up, have nice, cold, chilled water, 67 degrees, okay? I don't even know. Like, just, just have water ready for them. Like, hey, would you like a water? Would you like a coffee? No, I didn't have coffee. But I was like super excited. I get in the car, we start driving, and he looks at me and he says, this is the car they decided to pick me up in? Someone says, sure. <laughs> Oh my gosh, like literally, like if you want to rip a guy's heart out, like he just did it. He said, king, 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 king. like he just ripped my heart out. I was like, I, 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 he's like, man, they didn't have the Suburban or the Lincoln Navigator. I was like, <laughs> it's, it's so nice though. Look how clean it is. Like I literally want to be like, look at the outside. How clean is it? But I was so, I was so frustrated. My heart was torn. Have you guys ever been in that spot where you tried so hard and put all your effort in something and were still let down? Still let down? It's crazy. I feel, I feel like Timothy right here receiving this letter and is, is in a similar place, right? Because Paul writes to Timothy. He's like, okay, Timothy, there's a lot of false teachings, and I want you to rebuke the false teachings and rebuke the hypocrites, and I want you to guide people and lead people and pastor people and shepherd people. I want you to do all these things, and then you will be a servant. Can you imagine, like, receiving that letter? Like, this is a letter. Like, he doesn't even get to see Paul. Like, he even receives this letter. He's like, man, he's working so hard, putting his, all his effort into lead the church of Jesus. And what does he get? You're going to be a servant. He's like, can, can I at least be like a volunteer? <laughs> can I at least be like a life center volunteer? Like I get my background check and everything? Like maybe like on the facilities team or like a worthy janitor, but like a worthy servant, Paul? Are you serious? I'm like, put all my effort into this. And Paul's like, yes, after all these things you do, you will be known as a worthy servant. So what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus then? It means to be a servant. Point number one today is disciples serve. It's simple. Disciples serve. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 6, it says, If you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching you have followed. The end goal is not leadership. The end goal is servanthood. We, we, have, to, we have to wrap our, wrap our mind around this concept that the end goal isn't for Timothy to be proclaimed as this great pastor in Ephesus, but it's for Timothy to be known as this great servant, this worthy servant. Servanthood is the end goal, not leadership. In order to be a disciple of Jesus, we have to learn how to serve. And as we talk about serving today, serving the church, serving your community, serving your family, serving your friends, serving your mom and dad, you're serving, you're serving, you're serving. We're going to talk a lot about serving tonight. But I want to preface it with this thought. Even before you're a servant of Jesus, you're a son, and you're a daughter of Jesus. Because what, what we're going to talk about tonight is something that's near and dear to my heart. It's a conviction to serve Jesus and his people. But what, what can happen is if you get caught up in serving and serving and serving, you can quickly forget that before you were a servant, you were a son. Before you were a servant, you were a daughter. And that there's not enough you can do to make yourself worth more than just being a son or daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So as we talk about serving Jesus, I want, to, I want you guys to always bring yourself back to this point 
that before I do anything for Jesus, I am his child, and I am loved by him, and he has grace on my life and a future for me. And out of being a child of God, out of being a child, you know the Father's heart. And out of that, you know the Father's heart is to serve. It's to serve one another. It's to serve Jesus. Before you're a servant, you're a son or you're a daughter. Timothy goes on, he says, you'll be a worthy, or Paul goes on, you'll be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith. One who is nourished. I know we were just talking about food, right? Everything, food, is all good from Jesus, like all that stuff. Like, man, when I hear, like, I get to be nourished by the message of faith, I'm like, man, I want that. And, and I believe that you're here tonight because you want to be filled up. You want to be nourished by the message of Jesus. You want to be nourished by this message of faith. All right, but there's, there's two, two sides of, of faith that I see right now. Two, two types of Christians, two sides of the coin. Right, I see like the malnourished and, and, and the hungry, right, where, where they're, they go to church like maybe like once every two months, once every three months, and then they, they leave and they're just wanting more hope. And then those who are going to church every single Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, even sometimes on Wednesday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, they know every song, they know every podcast, they know every scripture. They're full, but not fulfilled. What's, what's the one thing that these two types of Christians have in common? They lack action. They lack serving Jesus. Faith without deeds is dead. Because it's, it's cool to listen to the message, but it's cooler to actually be a part of the message throughout the week. To actually live the message out. And I truly believe we are either starving or we're, oh, or we're fat Christians because we're not actually putting feet to our faith. And LC students, if you, if you want to be fully nourished, you want to be fully fulfilled by the, by the word of Jesus, you have to put this stuff into action. You have to actually live out the messages. You have to actually serve Jesus. You have to actually serve your community. Serve the people around you. Because when we do that, that's when we are fully nourished. Because you can come here every single Sunday and go out on Monday and still be empty. You're like, well, what's the solution? Serving Jesus. What's the solution? Serving the person to your right and to the left. What's the solution? Taking a posture of humility and learning how to actually be a disciple of Jesus. Disciples serve. So practical examples of this, because we don't want to just, just talk theory. We want to actually talk about life application. And my, my thought is this, that the first place that you can serve is your church right here. The body of believers, right? Why, why, why would you say that? Why, why would you, the first place to serve is, is within the church? Well, it says this in Ephesians 4.12, it says their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Paul's writing this to leaders, to pastors, to apostles, to evangelists and saying, hey, your work is to equip the church to what? To build up the church. To equip the church so that the church would serve the church. So, it's, so we have a premise. We have this standing of saying, okay, if you want to serve, we got to serve the church we got to serve the body and the community of believers around us, right? And I, and I love this because at the end of the day, you don't have to know how, right? That's why Paul's writing to the leaders and the pastors and evangelists and the apostles and all the teachers, because all you have to do is just be available. Because God has given the assignment to say, hey, their job is to equip you to serve the church and to serve your community. All we have to do is to simply be available. Available. If you're, if you're here tonight and you're like, hey, I'm, I'm available, and then and the next time you're like, I'm available, I'm available, I'm available, I'm available, every single week I'm available to be used by God, just watch what he will do in your life. He will do something miraculous. He'll do something that blows your expectation. He'll do something that transforms your life. If you just simply say, God, I'm available. You don't have to know all the scriptures. You don't have to know how to dress right or to look like this or to raise your hands like this or like this or to do this. Like, you don't have to know all those things. 
All you have to do to be a disciple of Jesus is simply be available for those to come alongside you to disciple you and lead you to teach you how to be a disciple of Jesus. And it looks like serving. It looks like serving. It looks like serving. It looks like taking that posture of humility and serving those around you. The times I felt most nourished in my life, the times I felt most full, like I was like fulfilling my purpose, is when I was serving constantly, like blood, sweat, tears, over and over again, like why am I doing this type of serving? You're just going, going, going. But I felt fulfilled because it wasn't necessarily what I was doing, it was who I was doing with. Like when you're like thinking like, man, do I really want to serve the church? Do I really want to be an usher or a greeter, be on Hannah's hospitality team or Denisha's connect team? Or we just went over all of our teams in our leaders meeting, like the setup and teardown team. Do I, really, do I really want to do those things? Do I really want to come here at 5.30 to set up church? Well, it's not about what you're doing. It's about who you're doing it with. It's about who you're serving And if you have the perspective and the mindset of, oh, I'm serving the church, I'm serving Jesus, and I'm doing it alongside of followers of Jesus, that's a different perspective than just showing up, pulling these drapes, setting up some lights for the photo booth. Because you could just view it as like, oh, man, what am I doing? Man, I'm just tired at 5.30. Oh, my gosh, this sucks. This is lame. I hate this. But if you take take a backseat, get a broader perspective, you would see that your faithfulness is actually doing something in your faith. That your obedience is actually broadening your perspective that you've never had in your entire life. But you have to take that first step and say, okay, I'm going to serve the church. I'm going to be a set up and tear down person. I'm going to be an usher or greeter. I'm just going to serve. But church is not the only place you can serve, right? You can serve your school. You can serve your teacher. Like, you just go up to your teacher and say, hey, what can I do for you? Whoa, that's crazy. That's a crazy idea, Josiah. That's crazy. Try it out. That's what it looks like to actually serve people. It's to go up to them and say, hey, what can I do for you? It's like, well, me and my teacher aren't like that. Well, find a teacher you can be like that with. Or go to your parents, your, your household. Maybe doing some extra chores before you're even told to. That looks like serving your household. Pretty sure I heard Denisha, the mom, say, amen. (laughs) Looking at your friends, looking at your enemies, and saying, how can I serve them? Can I buy someone a coffee? Can I buy someone lunch? Can I give them a ride? Can my parents give them a ride and they can hop in the car? Like, We have to have this mindset of like, if you want to really be a disciple of Jesus, it looks like serving people within the church, within the community, within your school, within your family. Disciples serve. I was working on this talk, I was thinking about the disciples of Jesus. And then I was thinking about the followers of Jesus. You ever look in the Bible how many followers of Jesus there were? Thousands, tens of thousands, crowds, masses, adults, women, children. They followed Jesus everywhere. But how many people are in this book named? Twelve disciples. Like, I, I want all of Tacoma to follow Jesus. But we're not just called to be followers of Jesus. We're called to be disciples of Jesus. And there's only 12 in this book that are named and we see like they're the 12 disciples of Jesus because it takes a little more effort. It takes a little more sacrifice. It takes a little more humility. It takes a little bit more time to truly be a disciple of Jesus because we can, we can be a follower all day. Come to church. Maybe I don't even take notes. I go into my school, be a good person, have good values, good morals, come to church maybe in a couple months. But man, we're doing this series so that we can actually be disciples of Jesus and change this world. So that we can actually take our faith serious and say, man, I'm going to come to church whether I want to or not. Man, I'm going to get a mentor. I'm going to get a pastor. I'm going to get people to speak into my life. I'm going to address some things that I need to, that I need to address. I want to be more like Jesus. 
being a disciple, we got to serve. Because a lot of times we want, you know, we want the platform, we want the voice, we want the followers, the subscribers, TikTok, whatever. Like, we, we, want, we want the limelight. Like, we, we, we are like narcissistic human beings. Like, we want people to be like, man, you're awesome, you're cool. And, like, we do that. We help, you. We, we encourage that. Like, we, you are amazing. But at the same time, when, when we're so focused on self, we forget to focus on Jesus. When we're so focused on building our own status, we forget about building his kingdom. Because we, we're in a society where everyone wants to be the GOAT. <laughs> Like, everyone wants to be the greatest of all time, whether it's dance, ballet, science, like TikTok. I want to be the best basketball player. I want to be the GOAT of football, the GOAT of Call of Duty, Rocket League, whatever. You want to be the GOAT of everything. You know what Jesus says about being the GOAT? He says in Matthew 12, or Matthew 23, he says, the greatest among you must be a servant. You want to be the GOAT? Serve. Serve. Like, this is so, this is so crazy. This is so crazy. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords came down from heaven and said, hey, you want to be the greatest? You just got to serve. Like, really? Like, I don't have to, like, hit the gym a lot or, like, I don't really have to, like, try my hardest. Like, I I don't have to, like, impress people. Like, I I don't have to, like, look the best and, like, have the best personality and, like, be the smartest in the room. He's like, no, 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 no. You just got to serve. And we look to Jesus as the goat. <laughs> we look to him as the, truly the greatest of all time that ever lived. And guess what? He came to this earth and he said to people, I have come not to be served, but to serve. He set the example for us. So if we're like, oh, geez, Josiah, chill out, man. This is a lot of serving. I don't know if I really want it. Well, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, if you want to move past a follower to a disciple, then you have to take that step into actually serving people, serving Jesus, reflecting who Jesus is. Disciples serve. The band can come back up. Point number two is this. Nate thought this was going to be a short message because there's only two points. (laughs) I knew, I was like, ooh, the first point's going to be a long one. Point number two is this. Disciples train. They train. First Timothy, that was the literally first Timothy 4, 6. Now we're going to the next verse. First Timothy 4, 7 through 9, it says this. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Someone say amen. amen. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Train yourself. What? Like, I had to reread this a couple times because I'm like, I love 1 Timothy 4. We teach it in the internship. We teach all this stuff in leadership seminars, all conferences. Like, train yourself? How did I not see this? Like, we, we, we rely so heavily on pastors and mentors and leaders and Bible teachers. But Paul is saying to this young Timothy, hey, I'm going to be there for you. But at the end of the day, your discipleship, your relationship with Jesus relies on one person, one person only, and that is you. Train yourself. Come on, Paul. I'm only in sixth grade. This is my first time here. Thank you for being here, if that's you. But train yourself. Far too long have we relied on other people's faith to sustain our own. Far too long have we relied on the, par- the faith of our parents and the faith of our pastors and the faith of the person to our left and the right and our grandparents, the faith and the discipleship of church culture and the discipleship of worship songs and media. We've relied on so many things to disciple us, but yet we forgot that Paul said to Timothy, train yourself to be godly. And, and don't get me wrong here. Use the resources and tools around you. I'm not saying get away from that and just go solo <laughs> and just go off into the wilderness and don't use anything. Yes, use resources, use pastors, use Bible apps, use all these things. But at the end of the day, you have to understand your discipleship to Jesus relies on you. 
you got to train yourself. He continues on. Where are we at? Train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and the life to come. Physical training is good. We encourage it. If you want to lift with us, DM us. <laughs> Physical training is good. But training for godliness is so much better. It's essential to our faith. Right? Training for godliness. Getting your spiritual six-pack. Like, that's, you need that. <laughs> like, hitting the spiritual gym. Like get into a little max spiritual bench at 450. Like you need that in your life. Spiritual training is good. It's necessary. And why is it necessary? Because it's promising benefits in this life and the life to come. There's a lot of things with physical training that can promise benefits in this life, but not so much the life to come. This whole, this whole talk on disciples train and disciples serve like, this isn't a huge, like, like, huge, like, trap or, like, disguise to, like, just get a whole bunch of student leaders and get a whole bunch of volunteers. Like, that would be awesome. But that, that's not the point of this. The point is that you would be truly nourished at the end of the day. The point is that you would have benefits in this life, in the life to come. God wants to bless you. He wants to pour out his blessing on you. But well, we have to understand the kingdom economy, and that's humility, teachability, serving, selflessness. Because when we do those things, it's not like, okay, this little transaction with God, we're like, hey, I'm going to be humble, then can I get some blessings? Like, no, that's not how it works. But you humble yourself, you be a disciple of Jesus, you serve and you serve and you serve, watch what God will do in your life. It will be amazing. Disciples serve. Disciples train. Because physical training is good. Training for godliness is much better. Will you guys bow your heads and pray with me? We're going to go back into the song. But my call tonight is a little different. Because this isn't, this isn't a series to just sit in the back row. No offense to those sitting in the back row. But figuratively sit in the back row and not do anything. This is a series where it looks like taking a step of faith into the call God has on your life. And it looks like to serve and train. If you're here tonight and you want to take that step into being a disciple of Jesus. You want to take that step and say, God, I'm available to serve. God, I want to train. If that's you, I want to pray for you. But here's what I want to do. On the count of three, I'm going to ask everyone to stand up. And if you're one of those people, I want you to step forward. Step forward right here at the, this altar. If you want to take that step of faith, it's going to take some courage and boldness. And if we can't live out our faith within this building, within a safe environment, it's going to be a lot harder to live our faith out there. So on the count of three, you want to say yes to that call, discipleship, that call to serve, that call to train for God.